So my name is George Bett. I teach at Washington and Lee University in the United States. I'm an art historian who works on the art of Florence, Italy in the 14th or 15th centuries. Um, I've published uh, books and articles on painting, on manuscripts, and on the way in which viewers in the Renaissance would have seen and understood works of art in front of them. In 2017, I became interested in a mapping project that was purely two-dimensional, where we wanted to pinpoint on a map and georeference the places where artworks were commissioned and produced in the 14th and 15th centuries. We wanted to see on a map the clusters of artists, patrons, subject matter, and materials that were being produced during those 200 years of the early Renaissance. As we got into the project, it became clear to us that we did not need to be limited to only a two-dimensional flat surface to a map. That with new technologies and some old ones like photogrammetry, but new ones uh, like point cloud models, we could actually create or recreate structures and place inside them the artworks that used to be there, but have been moved to other places. So for example, there are many paintings and sculptures in the Academia Museum or in the Uffizi, or in the Alta Pinacoteca in Munich, or the National Gallery in London, or Washington, or the Met in New York, that came from the buildings here in Florence that we had scanned. So it's our desire to make models of those artworks and then put them into the point clouds that we have made using Leica equipment and software. And in addition to those artworks, we add to them annotations. So we describe uh, the building. We will translate descriptions from the 18th and the 19th centuries that have been written in Italian or German, and we translate those into English. Uh, we write our own original essays. We transcribe documents, and we embed all of these into the point clouds and the photogrammetric models that we've made of artworks and buildings from the Italian Renaissance. It shows us what Florence looked like before the year 1500, when these objects were still in their original sites. So creating the point clouds of the buildings that, that are still in existence in Florence becomes important for us. That's the setting in which the paintings in the Uffizi, the Academia, they need to be seen. I'll give an example. Michelangelo's David. You've heard of the David? <laughs> of course. <laughs> well, the David was supposed to be seen from the top of the Duomo, the Cathedral of Florence. That was its intended location. No one has ever seen it, though, on top of the Duomo. They've never put it up there. But we can do that. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to capture the roof from one of the two bell towers of San Lorenzo looking down on top of the roof from above. Are you ready? <laughs> Very good. 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 Today we went through the portions of San Lorenzo that people never see. But we also scanned the vault over the cupola of the crossing of San Lorenzo, a space that I have never seen before. I've never seen scholars publish photographs of that space before. Now we have scans of it. And when we make the 3D model and put it online, everyone will have an opportunity to see something that no one could see before now. Now, some of the things that we saw today really interested me and surprised me. We've always thought that Brunelleschi was the architect behind the design of this building, and I can understand why. The proportions of the space, the measurements all say that it's Brunelleschi. But when we went up to the top and we looked at the brickwork, we noticed that the construction of the bricks were all laid horizontally. And Brunelleschi 
when he was thinking about construction, often liked to use a herringbone quality of horizontal bricks and vertical bricks that gives the structure an internal support. And we didn't see that today. So that makes me wonder about the construction team and the designs they were using as they were building that cupola and the vault over the church. We think that these scans and this model will be used not only by the general public and by students, we're quite sure now that scholars will be using this model for years to come because it shows the entirety of the building. With, with these measurements and with these models, you can, you can make dimensional plans out of these buildings. You can understand the measurements and the dimensions of any space that you want. And it's something that architectural historians just don't have an opportunity to do on a normal basis. And now everyone will be able to do it from home. This model will provide uh, subject matter for future conversations between scholars as they debate the authorship of, of the space. Yeah. component of it is what I think makes it unique in, in the, the world of, of digital humanities. This is where we go into extant structures in the city of Florence with our RTC unit. The RTC is a terrific unit uh, for a variety of reasons. It moves very quickly so I can, I can complete a single scan in medium density which gives me great point density and also terrific distance, maybe up to about 80 meters of distance, in only three minutes. Um, the, the quality of the scan is about as high as, as you can imagine without going into a, you know, a high density mode. Um, the color is terrific. For our purposes in creating the architectural environment, it's absolutely perfect. It's quick, it's incredibly accurate, the distance is, is fantastic, um, it's portable. I walked here from my apartment today, uh, a 15 minute walk, just by strapping it in, in, on my back in a backpack. So all of these things make it ideal for this kind of cultural heritage work. We scan the interiors and the exteriors of those structures. I transmit data back to my home institution at Washington and Lee University, where a team of staff and students go through the process of editing those scans, eliminating some modern things like fire extinguishers or speakers or electric lights. And then we try to recreate the space by inserting into those areas the objects that used to be there but have been removed uh, since then. I think San Lorenzo and Satomi Novella are probably the best models that we've produced so far. They're the most complete in part because the proprietors have given us total access to those spaces, including foundations and rafters. So basically soup to nuts, the whole structure. We're pretty confident that the model of the Palazzo Medici will be quite good. Uh, we've, again, gained access to some spaces that are generally off limits to the general public. So we're excited about bringing that all together so people can see things that they normally wouldn't be able to see. Each building is like your child or your children. Uh, they're all important in different ways. Uh, I think because of the access we've been granted, Santa Maria Novella and San Lorenzo are probably the two most important scans that we've done. However, um, Santa Croce remains near and dear to my heart because they did give us incredible access repeatedly over the last four years. We've gone back to redo spaces or perfect things. Every time we do a scan and get good access to a space, we wind up going into places that the general public and even the scholarly community have not really examined closely before. In March of 2023, I was able to go up on the roof of the church and convent of Santo Spirito. 
And during that process of going through the rafters and, and, and seeing the rooftop, we were able to capture elements of the cupola, of the dome there, in ways that permitted us to see the stone structure in ways that we just hadn't really seen before. There are no photographs that I know of that show the rafters of Santo Spirito and how the vaults have been constructed. Same thing goes with Santa Maria Novella, for example. We were able to get up into the rafters and go uh, look at the vaults very closely. Clearly, there have been custodians and staff who go up into those vaults over the centuries to maintain them. But as far as I know, the scholarly community has not had access to those spaces. And therefore, we've been able to see things like small holes that have been cut into the tops of vaults and churches where clearly ropes were, were dangled down through the holes into the church proper so that things could be elevated and lowered uh, uh, together by connecting the rope to a wheel up in the rafters that could be cranked so that all the ropes could be elevated and then lowered at the same time. So we've been able to find some really interesting things that, that I can't say are completely unknown, but haven't really been written about or understood by the general public. So creating these models and putting them in a place where anyone can see them whenever they want actually provides incredible access to both general users, but also the scholarly community. We're standing right now in the Palazzo Medici. This is a mid 15th century palace that was constructed with designs by an architect named Micolozzo. Right now we're standing in the chapel, the private chapel of the family that's in the palace, which is kind of unusual for the period. In the 15th century, you didn't see this very frequently. The entire space is decorated with frescoes that were produced by an artist named Benozzo Gozzoli. This room is a great example. We scanned most of the palace already. Today we're going to be scanning the chapel. And what's interesting about this chapel is that there's a little section of it, a little square that was cut out of the room in the 18th century in order to change the dimensions of the chapel. And in so doing, they moved portions of the fresco so that you don't really see the way it was intended to be understood when the painting was completed around 1460. So what we're going to try and do back in our lab is use these scans to reposition those sections of the wall that were moved in order to create a new little alcove in the, in the chapel in order to refit the room uh, so you can see how those paintings were supposed to be seen when they were originally finished. The scanner itself is quite simple to use. Um, I'm always trying to get into corners. I'm always trying to get around objects that might be in the middle of a room. So I'm careful to get floors, angles, the tops of things and the bottom of things. Sometimes I'll scan using the tripod. I usually scan using the tripod, but occasionally I'll take the scanner off the tripod and put it on the floor so that I get underneath pews or, or choir stalls. In the field, using the iPad as a connector, I'm always careful to make sure that I'm connecting one scan to the other and aligning them in the field. If I don't do that, it means later that evening I need to go back home and do those connections before I transmit them back to the university. And that gets to be complicated sometimes. If I've done 90 scans in a single day, which happens very frequently, sometimes it's hard for an old man like me to recreate each one of those scans and to remember what was supposed to be connected to the other. So my, if I'm doing it in real time as I'm scanning, things work really quite, quite well. And then we'll use Cyclone Register 360, the software package provided by Leica, to begin the editing process of removing things that are extraneous. That process takes longer than you might realize. There are some moments where you've done a project and there aren't very many things you need to eliminate, so you can just do the editing process with the entire project as a whole entity. But there are other projects where you'll have lots of interference where you'll have um, some overexposed bits because sunlight is flashing through a window or there are going to be some really dark corners. So that means we'll have to go through scan by scan and, and fix uh, exposure settings and, and light features. So there's no way to predict how long each project will take to edit. Then we bring them together to stitch the complete model 
and then we begin to inspect it to see how we've done. Uh, if there are areas that we've missed, we go back in and fix them. And then we save it, post it online, and we wait for feedback. What I've learned, one of the big takeaways, I have come to respect greatly the work that surveyors do. This is hard work. You've got to be thinking all the time. You're always on. It's easy to get distracted and you've got to be able to maintain that concentration throughout. Uh, and a good scan, a good model, hmm, it's something I really admire. So art historians are becoming really excited about this approach to art history. And we're seeing it not just in the city of Florence, but we're seeing it in Egypt, we're seeing it in France, we're seeing it in India and Nepal now, uh, as some of my students are going and, and, and expanding uh, this, this kind of conversation digitally using this kind of equipment. So the response has been terrific and it's been very positive. The work that we're doing, the models we're making, the spaces that we're recreating, do not replace the real thing. It is not our intention to make this material obsolete. And by this material, I mean the paintings behind me or the spaces in which we're standing. The point here is to draw you to it so that you see it for yourself. There is no substitute for using your own eye to look at altarpieces or frescoes, architectural spaces or sculptures. So this is in no way intended to replace the real thing. Instead, it's intended to help you understand that space either before you arrive to it or after, you, after you've left it and have questions. So you can go back and check it. You can measure it. Um, you can cut things away and see things from different perspectives. You can visit it from your home in Buenos Aires or Ames, Iowa or Tokyo. And if you don't have the money to travel to Florence for any reason, these things can be used to at least understand the space and get a sense of what you're looking at as you're studying Florentine culture and the Italian Renaissance. Uh, we've been working on this project since 2018. So it's been about five years of scanning. I assume that I'll be working on this project for at least another 10 years, maybe 15. So keep coming back to the site because we're always adding to it. And I want to make an important comment here. Digital humanities is an incredibly complicated approach to thinking about the past and to think about cultural heritage. You can't do it alone. One single person cannot do all of the different moving parts and features of this kind of project. I depend on my students, on my staff partners, on other scholars who participate in this project with me, but most importantly, on the proprietors of the buildings who grant me access and who sometimes lead me by the hand from one room to the other. So it is truly a collaborative effort. Without that, these kinds of projects cannot function. So Florence as it was, .wlu.edu is the place to inspect these models and I urge you to go and spend a lot of time there because everything that we put on our website is free of charge to the public. Thank you.